I think it's absolutely incredible that we have Rolf Diamant as a as our presenter today, especially after this rousing um, discussion by um, Elliot. Uh, Rolf probably has had what I would consider the ideal career because he's combined history with landscape or state parks or national parks. His last gig, his last gig was at the National Historic Park, which is fabulous. If I'm sure you've all been there, which is the Marsh Billings Rockefeller Historic Park, which is outside Woodstock. Mm -hmm an incredible place which combines everything you want to know about the forested landscape with um, agriculture. I mean, it is just in, it is Vermont I mean, <laughs> in a place, everything together. And he's also been able to, and I'm on, I have to say this as a personal aside, when I go to a historic site, often the park rangers are more informed and better spoken about the site than almost anyone else I've met. The first time I went to Independence Hall in Philadelphia, the park ranger blew me away, just period. His knowledge of what happened in that spot was spectacular. And um, so you've had the great jobs and they're now focusing more on history. And he's going to tell us about the Vermonters and the blockade board backdoor war during the Civil War. And this is something we don't really hear much about. Um, I first came across Rolf when he gave a presentation, which uh, his book is on. He, he gave this presentation last year at Shelburne Farms. Um, He's written a book with Ethan Carr called Olmstead and Yosemite, Civil War Abolition and the National Park Idea. And it really put some great sensibility into the concept of how actually the national parks were developed um, and not some thing that Teddy Roosevelt bullied through with a whip. Uh, so uh, Rolf, please. Well, thank you, Carolyn. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you for the invitation, and, and I'm happy to, I, I wish I could have joined you today, but I'm happy to see everyone, uh, and I'm happy to learn, uh, hear about Elliot's work on the Monitor Barn uh, as an adjunct associate professor in the Historic Preservation Program at UVM. Um, I, I'm terribly proud of um, people like Elliot who go through the program and are able to uh, not only uh, apply various skills, uh, but do it here in Vermont and improve the built landscape uh, for all of us to enjoy. Um, that program is so vital and uh, to see people like Elliot coming out of it just is uh, heartening. Um, so thank you, Carolyn, you're, you're, you've been a real uh, trooper. Um, uh, and uh, I also want to thank Angie, Angie Grove back there, uh, who, who is a can-do person. By definition, she can, seems to be able to apply her energy and solve any problem that comes her way. Mm -hmm. uh, really remarkable. Uh, we could have used a few more Angies in the National Park Service, I can tell you that. <laughs> um, did you hear that? Uh, and I also want to uh, uh, just do a quick shout out to my friend, Sarah Dopp, uh, only because Sarah has done so much for just about everyone you know in Vermont. She is <laughs> everywhere. Uh, and uh, 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 just a compassionate and hard worker. And uh, the, the, the state owes her a huge debt of gratitude for all, all the boards and uh, groups she's worked on. Um, so what am I gonna talk about this afternoon? Well, uh, you know, I gotta tell you a little background. I, I, I started on this subject um, when I was researching my book on Olmsted and Yosemite, and you may scratch your head and wonder what Vermont has to do with that and certainly what the Civil War might have to do with that. But in fact, it, you know, I, I, my uh, research took me to um, uh, the coast of South Carolina, actually Port Royal. Um, and uh, the social revolution that was sparked there 
by the arrival of federal troops uh, very early on in the Civil War um, that really accelerated emancipation, the whole process. In fact, a, a process of self-emancipation that made the, uh, in some respects, made the formal Emancipation Proclamation inevitable. Um, and this was the movement of uh, formerly enslaved people to freedom on their own, uh, on their own volition, uh, and to the sanctuary of federal lines. But this got me uh, looking at, well, where did, where did these U.S. soldiers arrive from? And, and what were they doing uh, on the edge of the continent in uh, South Carolina? And in fact, they were not only there, they were in Georgia, and lo and behold, they were in Louisiana. And where did, who were they? Where did they come from? And in fact, uh, this story is about the fact that some number of them actually came from here, uh, were recruited in Vermont and sent, uh, uh, and you, it's really gonna be hard for you, and I'll show some slides, but it's gonna be hard for you to get your head around uh, what they had to think about, which was going from the snows of Brattleboro uh, all the way around uh, by ship down the coast of um, the United States around, hooked around the Florida Keys and found themselves in the Gulf of New Mexico. Um, and if, um, if they underwent a journey to the, far, to, the, to the moon, and that's what it was really like for many of them, I would say really that they went to the far side of the moon um, <laughs> because this was unlike anything they had ever experienced before. So I got interested in this story because there's a social component to this. It's not just military history. This backdoor war, which was fought along the coastline of the deep south, it was far from the, those main battlefields of the Civil War that we are so familiar with. This is a thousand miles from Gettysburg, uh, from Cedar Creek. Um, uh, and yet Vermonters paid a consequential, but a really little understood role in the social revolution that was sparked uh, by this backdoor war. First by arming and training freedmen, freed, freed formerly enslaved, then by actually accepting commissions to command and to lead the first black soldiers. And finally in the service of the Freedmen's Bureau, during the era of Reconstruction. So Vermonters had a part of the, part of the story of each of these uh, events, which really is tied to the story of um, probably the greatest transformation in the history of this country, which was the ending of slavery um, and uh, the attempt to um, provide civil rights to a population that had been brought over in bondage. Um, so uh, bear with me and I'm going to switch to my slides here. Take me a moment. Um, and I, I'm just gonna show you two, 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 um, two images that you should be familiar with. One is a, a mid-century, 19th century map of Vermont. Um, uh, with a recruitment poster sandwiched it between a map of Louisiana. And this is really how this story played out. Now, just a, a little bit of background. Um, and I'm gonna talk about a, a US government agency far older than the National Park Service, and that is the US Coastal Survey. And you may ask, what the heck does Vermont have to do with the, with the U.S. Coastal Survey? And it's a, it'd be a legitimate question. This was an organization that was created in, in 1807 by Thomas Jefferson. And their job was surveying the coastline of the United States. This was very important to the country to be able to know its, uh, its coast. It was uh, a lot of its revenue came from um, import duties and they, uh, they wanted to know where ships were coming through. And so this was the organization and also they wanted safe navigation. So they needed to put markers down and lighthouses. They needed nautical charts. And this organization became known as the nation's chart maker. Um, and the gentleman on the right is the first director. Uh, and he was a director from 1844, right through the civil war. And we'll get to him in a minute. 
Um, but if you're wondering what happened to the U.S. Coastal Survey, if you're familiar with NOAA, that's the successor agency today. And so this is what they produced. This is a map of the Gulf of, of the coastline, southern coastline, from uh, the Panhandle of Florida to the head of the passes, which is the entrance to the Great Mississippi River, uh, the mouth of the Mississippi on the lower left, the Panhandle of Florida on the far right, and uh, the coastline of Alabama, Mississippi, and Louisiana. Um, these charts became invaluable when the Civil War broke out. But there was one other thing that the U.S. Coastal Survey produced, and this is a remarkable map. This map is still, I have to say, I've done a, as much reading as I can on it, and it's still a bit of a mystery in terms of its uh, uh, timing, its creation. It was a product of the Coastal Survey who had lots of map makers, very talented map makers. And they had access to the uh, 1860 uh, census. And this is a very early statistical map that's shaded to show the density of enslaved people county by county throughout the South. What is now, the this map was to become absolutely essential in the conduct of the Civil War, and I'll explain that later. But this map was um, created, uh, uh, released in, uh, early in 1861. The Lincoln administration hadn't been a month or two in office, and I have no idea how long they've been working on this. Um, it's a there's a backstory here would be fascinating, but this became an absolutely essential document for the prosecution of the Civil War. Now, um, as soon as the war broke out, that there was a real challenge because um, uh, let me jump a slide forward. Um, the only way to really win this war, they, they need, two things needed to happen. One, they had to shut down uh, the export of cotton from the Confederacy because that was its cash crop and it was the largest cash crop in the whole United States. Um, but to do that, they had to blockade uh, 3,500 miles of coastline. It's a phenomenal undertaking. The United States Navy was small. Um, that was almost 200 different inlets, harbors, and rivers where commerce, uh, where, where trade passed through. Um, and major ports, and ports like Pensacola, Florida, Norfolk, Virginia, Mobile, Alabama, Wilmington, Del uh, Wilmington, North Carolina, uh, Charleston, of course, in South Carolina, and Galveston in Texas, and the two big ones, Savannah, and the biggest of all, New Orleans. Now to do this, uh, this they, they, they essentially resorted to kind of a skunk works effort very early in the war. They assigned four guys to sit in an office in the Smithsonian Castle in the early Smithsonian Institute. It was a quiet corner space. Bach was on the board and, and was, it was maybe, I think he may have been running it at that point, one of his many assignments. So that was not a problem to get space there. And for four months, they poured over these charts, figuring out how the heck are they going to be able to affect a blockade of 3,500 miles of coastline. And in four months, they came up with a plan. And they drew on the inspiration of an earlier idea that was uh, of, of old Winfield Scott, who was a, was a general of the army up until about the time the Civil War broke out. But he had an, a concept which he called the Anaconda Plan. And if you can, um, you can see this from this cartoon, the Anaconda, of course, is a great snake. And his idea was to strangle the Confederacy. And essentially this blockade would be like a giant snake and they would squeeze the uh, economic life out of the South and it would the war would be over with hardly a shot being fired. Well, it didn't quite work out that way, but the plan had some merit. And so the blockade board came up with this idea that uh, they would establish these blockading squadrons uh, along the uh, southeastern coastline and also in the Gulf that would um, prevent um, uh, blockade runners and uh, merchant ships from uh, supplying the South 
one, exporting cotton, and two, bringing in munitions uh, that were absolutely essential for uh, the continuation of the war. But to do that, they had to land troops uh, and establish bases along certain points on the coast. They couldn't send their, their blockading ships back up to Brooklyn Navy Yard or Washington Navy Yard to get resupplied, recalled, refueled, and send them all the way back there. They had to stay on station. So they needed bases that were in the South. And so the plan was to seize uh, little bits of land along the coast. And these blue arrows are the, uh, are the points in which the blockade board recommended um, incursions. One is on the coast of North Carolina. One was around Point Royal, which I referred to. Um, one was at the mouth of the Savannah River, Fort Pulaski, which shut off the har uh, Great Harbor uh, of Savannah. Um, but one was also uh, in the, the uh, mouth of the Mississippi River to essentially plug it up by seizing New Orleans. And New Orleans was the great prize. New Orleans was the largest commercial port in the Confederacy, gateway to the Mississippi Valley. It was, it was the most strategic prize uh, objective uh, of the war uh, at that point. Um, now, so where does Vermont come into this story? Well, um, they needed troops along with ships. And so they went to Vermont and asked for about 2,000 Vermont soldiers, two regiments, 7th and 8th Vermont, to be part of an expeditionary army that would be sent to capture New Orleans very early on in the war in the spring of 1862. Now, it took a while to get there. They first had to leave their camp in um, Brattleboro. They had to board a train. They had to go down to New Haven, Connecticut, get on a ferry, um, steam up Long Island Sound, uh, march to the Brooklyn Navy Yard and board ships in, in New York Harbor and uh, put to sea. Uh, and they did this and it was hellacious. It took 26 days. And there's a small map in the lower right-hand corner just to sh show you this, um, a small piece of the, the coastline there. But they had to go all the way down um, the southeast coastline, hook around the Keys. And then um, they landed in a speck of land. They landed in this tiny island uh, off the coast of Mississippi called uh, Ship Island, a deserted, uninhabited place, uh, inhabited only by mosquitoes and sand flies. And it was miserable. And of course, you're talking about these guys who, who left Vermont while there was still snow on the ground in April and uh, were uh, just bombarded by heat in May in this Gulf environment. This was a staggering uh, shift in their environment. And of course, you know, these were primarily farm boys who had never been off the farm. They hadn't been out of the county, let alone out of state, and certainly hadn't been on a ship and uh, certainly ne never been uh, in, in the tropics. Um, uh, they, they had also very little resistance to disease. And as a consequence, there were far more casualties inflicted by yellow fever and malaria and dysentery than there were by Confederate bullets. Um, and it was, uh, it, it was truly unworld, an unworldly experience. Now, um, I'm going to just uh, just say that uh, a battle was fought to open up the Mississippi River and uh, New Orleans was captured. Um, and Vermonters uh, found themselves part of uh, a federal army that was a United States Army that was stationed in Louisiana. Um, um, this was, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a difficult assignment. And, and in fact, um, this is a, some photographs I took years ago in Chalmette, uh, Louisiana, uh, along the Mississippi River. And a lot of those boys, you know, their bodies are still, they're still interred in, in, in Louisiana, including this, this soldier um, who's buried uh, right along the Mississippi River on the 7th Vermont, Joseph Bordeaux. Now, um, 
the commander of the 7th, uh, 8th Vermont, um, uh, a guy named John, uh, John Walcott Phillips, uh, he was a regular soldier, a West Pointer, um, but he was also an abolitionist. And when he landed on Ship Island, he had a copy of his own Emancipation Proclamation in his pocket. And of course, the Lincoln administration hadn't issued any of anything in, from Washington and Congress hadn't done anything. So uh, the War Department was uh, very unhappy with Phelps. Um, and Lincoln in particular didn't want to be usurped by a field officer. Um, but, uh, you know, as soon as those troops got, got in, into the Delta region, um, events took took their own course. Um, and within a year or so, 150,000 enslaved people had uh, liberated themselves and self-emancipated themselves without waiting for Washington to, to uh, codify any, uh, any proclamation or any law. Um, and this massive movement, this social revolution that occurred, which the Vermonters found themselves right in the middle of, uh, was a remarkable event that in fact put great pressure on the Lincoln administration to move its agenda, to accelerate uh, its own plans for emancipation. Um, this is just a, uh, a graphic from actually, that's Fort Pulaski on the Savannah coastline, but this is what went on all along the coast where these incursions occurred. They were, you know, I showed you that map, um, um, of uh, the density of slaves. It just so happened, and this is uh, the world of uh, maybe intended, maybe unintended consequences, but those incursions were in places with some of the densest populations of uh, enslaved labor um, and um, uh, la labor farms in, uh, in the United States. And the, and the gentleman in the middle is, um, this fellow Phelps. Um, and uh, when uh, enslaved people got to seek sanctuary in his, in his camps, um, he was given orders to put them to work. That's what they were good for, they were laborers. He had his own plants. He started drilling them as soldiers and he formally requested rifles and arms and ammunition for the new formations of uh, black soldiers that he was in the process of raising. Um, you know, timing is everything. It, he was really about two months too soon. He was two months ahead of Abraham Lincoln. And if he had waited uh, for another two months, he would have been, uh, you know, a, a hero, uh, but he was impatient. And he insisted that the time was now and the War Department uh, uh, didn't agree, and he got it. He was really angry that when the arms he requested were withheld, and he resigned his commission and went back to Vermont. Uh, flash forward a few months later, the Emancipation Proclamation is uh, law is now uh, going to be announced. Um, uh, the Militia Act passes Congress, which authorizes. Uh, African-Americans to fight as soldiers in the United States Army. And Lincoln actually approaches Phelps and offers him, it offers him command of all black regiments that are now to be raised. And Phelps says, fine, but I want her on apology first. <laughs> and Lincoln doesn't, didn't do apologies. Um, and Phelps stayed in Vermont. And, uh, uh, Things moved on. Um, um, so uh, there was a rapid mobilization of black soldiers. Now, th that story is complicated because at first they were paid only half of or, or a third of what white soldiers would be paid. They were not armed as well. Um, and um, oh, just a, a quick uh, a note, um, you can tell how important this map became uh, that I've been talking about. When you look more carefully at uh, Francis Bicknell Carpenter's painting of Abraham Lincoln presenting the draft 
Pro uh, Emancipation Proclamation to his cabinet in September of uh, 1862. And uh, Bicknell actually includes a reproduction of the map in the lower corner and you look at the green arrow. That's the uh, Coastal Survey map, no question. You could see that I've, I've blown up a piece, uh, a, a quadrant of it uh, right next to it. Um, and this was used now, it, at first it was uh, the blockade board uh, uh, was uh, had its own objectives, but clearly once the decision was made that the it was absolutely essential to raise black soldiers to help uh, the United States win the war, uh, then it became a very useful document for figuring out where to go to recruit soldiers. And uh, by the war's close, by about 18, 1865, there were about 180,000 black soldiers in the United States Army. Um, it, it was a substantial part, 20% of frontline troops and essential to the war effort. Now, two, two uh, sidebar real quickly, two, two quick observations. One by a Confederate general who uh, was very worried about the, the, the recruitment of um, uh, formerly enslaved soldiers. And he recommended that uh, the, the uh, labor farms or plantations move their enslaved people away from uh, advancing uh, federal troops. And he, because he, he argued of our plantations are made his recruiting crap stations. Every sound black male left for the enemy becomes a soldier who we will have to fight afterwards. He, uh, Kirk, uh, Kirby Smith understood that this was a game changer, that enslaved people were going to return, but this time they were gonna be wearing the uniform of the United States Army and they're gonna ha have a rifle in their hands. And, and uh, no one understood the, the, the political implications of this better than Frederick Douglass, who, who wrote, once let the black man get upon his person the brass letters U.S. Let him get an eagle on his button and a musket on his shoulder and bullets in his pocket, and there's no power on earth that, to, that can deny that he has earned the right to citizenship in the United States. Now there were 150, uh, I, I need to mention, there were 150 black Vermonters who um, fought in um, the United States Colored Troops, which is the, um, the USST, UCST, which is the abbreviation for all the black regiments um, that were raised. Uh, but they include uh, 12 veterans who were buried just down the street from me at uh, the River Street Cemetery. Um, at first, the very first uh, black regiments uh, had colored officers, had black officers. But, you know, the sad story is that, in fact, you know, you're aware that the army was segregated from the very beginning and they would not accept these black officers. And, and, and after a while, they were purged, essentially replaced. And they needed new officers. They needed white officers. Um, uh, and they sought... Um, these officers in the ranks of federal troops um, by offering them promotions. And they saw uh, the vast majority of them were gonna be either uh, non-commissioned officers um, or enlisted men. And they were gonna get a commission as an officer of the United States Army. Not only was this a big step up, but for a lot of Vermonters, it meant uh, a boost in pay. And so there were some who were ready officers like Hiram Perkins, who, um, was in the 8th Vermont, who later joined the 73rd, was commander of the 73rd US Colored Troops. And uh, uh, someone like Rufus Kingsley, who was a corporal, and he, he accepted a commission in the 74th U USCT uh, as a first lieutenant. Um, now, this was not an easy choice to make for any of these Vermonters. Um, the 8th Vermont, which was in Louisiana, had uh, between four to 500 active officers and men present for duty at any given time. And in 1862 to 1863, 
no fewer than 42 actually uh, offered uh, their services and received commissions in colored regiments. 90% uh, were enlisted men or NCOs. That was about 10% of the, the regiment. That's, that's extraordinary. That's about four times the average of any other regiment in, in the federal army. And why was this true of the 8th Vermont? I don't know exactly. Um, they faced some uh, daunting issues. And uh, the, the commander of uh, uh, these troops, the guy who, who essentially took over where Phelps uh, declined, uh, Daniel Ullman, General Ullman, uh, wrote after the war, they were selected by me as men who will be competent against the vehement and bitter opposition of friends and foes of our government, friends and foes. To accept an appointment in a colored regiment was in fact facing a whirlwind of prejudice. To invite um, the desertion of friends and the implacable hatred of enemies. The former, they met with sorrow, the latter with derision. Now, uh, Given the amount of race prejudice uh, across, not only in the South, but across the North, um, service as a officer in a black regiment was, uh, you know, it, 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 it was a whirlwind of prejudice that had to be overcome. Um, and in addition, uh, when they, the implacable hatred of enemies was uh, not just rhetorical, if they had been captured and that some were captured on the battlefield, they knew that they would not be treated as prisoners of war according to the rules of law. Jefferson Davis had, and the Confederate Congress had enacted a law that said any white person commanding Negroes or mulattoes in arms should be deemed as inciting servile insurrection and should, if captured, be put to death. So this was, uh, you know, this, this was a substantial risk as well. And it was such a great risk. Um, uh, and some Vermonters, in fact, were captured at the Battle of Port Hudson in Louisiana. Um, Abraham Lincoln had to do something. Uh, if he had done nothing, and um, because the threat was twofold. One, they were going to kill white officers, execute them on the spot. And they were any black soldiers who were recaptured, were captured, whether they had been formerly slaved or free, free men, Free, free, free citizens. If they had been captured, they would have been re-enslaved. So they were desperate, desperately uh, seeking uh, black recruits. So they had to do something. And what the Lincoln administration did, and uh, this, uh, this is the words of Abraham Lincoln: "It is the duty of every government to give protection to its citizens of whatever class, color, or condition." and especially to those who are duly organized as soldiers in the public service. So these were not just uh, hollow words. Lincoln backed it up and said that for every soldier who was killed in retaliation, uh, a Confederate soldier prisoner of war would be executed. And for every person enslaved by the enemy and sold or sold into slavery, a rebel soldier should be placed at hard labor on the public works. Uh, this was General Order 233. Um, and this was critical. This, you know, the, 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 uh, the, he had to act. And, and, and this um, um, was, uh, to, to some degree, uh, a break on the threats that were being made against these, these both black and white soldiers. Now I'm gonna wrap up by making a few observations about uh, reconstruction following the conclusion of the war. And this continued involvement of Vermonters, even in this period of reconstruction, when all the troops essentially had been sent home from the battlefield. And were finally, if they had survived the terrible war, they were finally at home, except those who chose to join something called the Freeman's Bureau and stay in the South and fight for civil rights. And uh, the Freedmen's Bureau, which was founded in 1865 and lasted about seven years, 
was probably arguably the first social welfare agency in the, in the history of the United States. It was there to um, facilitate the transition of people from slavery to freedom. Um, and they, 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 were, they did everything. They assisted uh, formerly enslaved people by issuing marriage licenses, uh, helping them find uh, loved ones who had been sold uh, down the river in, in, in bondage um, so they could find family members who had been split up by uh, um, slave masters. Um, they supplied necessities such as food and clothing. Um, they set up schools, the first uh, public schools attended by uh, black children in, in the Southern states. They insisted and they, they, they codified labor contracts so no one would work in bondage. They, everybody who had a job, who, who worked would at least have a contract which guaranteed some wage. And they tried at least for a time to settle freedmen on abandoned or confiscated lands. Now, all of these ac activities were, were hamstrung a large part by President Andrew Johnson, and, and um, um, but there were this this the Freedmen's Bureau was certainly a concerted effort by the United States government to try to do the right thing. And uh, there are five Vermonters I'm going to just quickly call out who uh, were involved in this. There's a guy named uh, William Stickney who was in the Eighth Vermont Regiment and went to Louisiana and later was an officer in the 99th USCT. He was the first superintendent of public colored schools in the city of New Orleans. And he became a general superintendent of the Freeman's Bureau for all of Northwestern Louisiana. There was uh, Frederick M. Kimball, another Vermonter from the 6th Vermont Regiment who was seconded as an officer. You know, they, they needed staff people for, for the Freeman's Bureau. So they, they, they actually borrowed uh, active duty officers who were willing to continue their duty in the United States Army and, and work for the Freedmen's Bureau. And he was superintendent of the Bureau's offices in, in a number of counties in Virginia. He supervised voter registration and elections and the establishment of colored schools. Now, multiple times he was threatened and shot at by the Ku Klux Klan, um, but he stuck with it. And when the Freedmen's Bureau was finally disbanded by Congress. Um, uh, he received an honorable discharge after seven uninterrupted years of military service. It's a remarkable record. Um, the, probably the best known person in this group is a, a guy named Marshall Twitchell. He was discovered by PBS in their documentary on as some of you might have seen on Reconstruction. Um, he had a, a, an ill-fated political career uh, in Louisiana, um, um, but he worked for a time for the Freemans Bureau. And later when involved in Republican politics in Louisiana, he was uh, very nearly uh, killed, uh, lost both his arms in an assassination attempt by the Klan. And there was a, 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 a black man, free black man from, uh, from Vermont, uh, Loudon Langley, who uh, served with the 33rd uh, USCT. Uh, and he was act very active. He, was, he, he, he became a lawyer at, uh, uh, during Reconstruction. He moved to South Carolina. He was a, um, a, a participant in the 1868 effort to rewrite the South Carolina Constitution, state constitution, at that time endorsing black citizenship and uh, the amendments to the constitution uh, guaranteeing um, black male suffrage and equal access under the law. Um, and lastly, um, uh, there's a, a guy named John Dick, uh, Dickinson. He fought with the 7th Vermont. He ran the Freedmen's Bureau's offices in, uh, in Jackson County, Florida. He never came back. He was assassinated by the Ku Klux Klan in 1871. Before he was killed, he wrote, I have no ambition to fill a more honorable grave than that of a man who falls for the sake of opinion or conduct. 
that he knows is right, even though everyone else thinks is wrong. So why should we pay more attention to this story today? And so I'm, this is my uh, punchline and my conclusion. Well, um, we need to broaden the existing focus that for, we've had so long and justifiably on heroic Vermont stories associated with the Civil War and its seminal engagements, such as in the, in the slide on the left is the great canvas uh, of the Battle of Cedar Creek in the, at the Vermont State House. And, you know, the stories of uh, Standard's uh, counterattack at Gettysburg or the Cedar Creek, uh, the Vermonters' heroic work uh, at Cedar Creek, to, to also to look at the wider context of Vermont's involvement with uh, self-emancipation, emancipation and reconstruction, because there's a story, we, there's a story there that needs to also be acknowledged, not just the heroism, but also uh, the commitment to social progress. And I included um, a slide on the right, that was uh, a, 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 the congressional delegation from the South um, uh, during the Reconstruction era, uh, where, where there were uh, seven uh, senators and congressmen um, uh, um, from uh, black senators and congressmen from uh, reconstructed states at the high point of reconstruction. That's a story we, we need to tell as well. Now, I, I, I bring this up in the context that there are, you should be aware that there are a group of teachers right now, I mean, right this at this very moment, who are actively uh, working um, to uh, improve the teaching of reconstruction and these hidden stories in Vermont uh, and they held a um, teaching reconstruction workshop in Brattleboro back in last March, March 23. Um, and um, uh, they're trying to get um, um, the state of Vermont to uh, pay more attention to this story. And uh, uh, the, uh, the, one of the organizations who sponsored this, the Zen Educational Project, points out that too often the story of this grand experiment in interracial democracy is skipped over or rushed through, or in fact, in many places across the United States, just taught inaccurately. And one teacher was quoted in the Brattleboro Reformer, and they wrote a long article on this meeting of teachers, this workshop, that without state expectations to include re the reconstruction era information as a requirement of the curriculum, teachers are more likely to choose the context for which they're most comfortable and knowledgeable. If you leave it up to the teachers, if, if they don't have access to current scholarship, they, if they're not encouraged, they will default to what they've been doing um, up to now. And it's not to take anything away from our, our wonderful teachers in the state of Vermont, but they need tools and they need support and they need encouragement. And so that's my presentation for this, this afternoon. You've been very patient. It's, it, there's a complex legacy to this backdoor war. It's not just a military story. It's very much the story of the beginning of a, a major change in this country, a transition um, from slavery to freedom, which is perhaps the most important and inspiring story uh, uh, of this country. And, um, I can't, couldn't say it any better than uh, Elise Go uh, Goyette, uh, who wrote in Vermont History back in 2014, that the Southern narrative of the war and reconstruction still has a currency in Vermont, unfortunately, and we are still struggling to dig ourselves out. We need to continue this struggle by telling real stories of real people from the Civil War to the present. This history matters to us today. So everyone uh, has been very patient. And uh, if you still have uh, a little energy, um, I'm going to stop sharing my slides. And if there's time, I'll answer a question or two. But thank you for your, uh, your, your polite patience.
So does anyone have any questions? So Carolyn, it might logistically, it might work best if you stand near the laptop. And then when someone has a question, if you can kind of repeat it into there in case we all can't hear from where the speaker is. Kathleen? I would like to know who the last person mentioned was. The man who, I didn't write. Who was the last person mentioned of the Vermonters on that slide? Was that... The one who was uh, killed by the Ku Klux Klan. Yeah, um, he was, I'll have to uh, look at the slide. And I'll think of it in a second. It wasn't Stickney, it wasn't. Uh, um, something or other. John Dickinson? Dickinson. He, he was in Florida. He was killed while on duty working for the Freedmen's Bureau. Oh. Sarah? Yeah, just have to hear something about General O. O. Howard. <laughs> Sarah would like to hear something about General Howard. You know, I, I ran across his uh, a photograph of his burial, and he's buried here in Vermont. And I didn't know that until I started preparing for this talk. Uh, Howard was the, um, you know, the Freedmen's Bureau was a quasi political military organization, as I explained. It, not only did it have a lot of staff who were seconded uh, directly from the army, but it, its its director was appointed from the army, and that's General Howard, who was a very distinguished um, commander uh, during uh, the Civil War, and he was um, against. Uh, it was really an uphill battle for him, particularly with Andrew Johnson as president, but. Um, uh, Sarah, maybe you can fill me in because I don't know a lot about him other than he was director of the of the Freedmen's Bureau, and he he must have li been living in his uh, in retirement in Vermont. Yeah. He lived right up on uh, Summit, right across on Summit Street, right across from Brass Mount, and um, it was his son, I believe, who was responsible for the construction of Fort Ethan Allen. Um, his granddaughter was my mother's sorority sister. So Susan Howard would never have a conversation without reminding you that her grandfather was <laughs> so And was, of course, uh, Howard University is named and Howard, University. Yeah. Howard, yeah. Howard University. Howard University, the yeah. foremost black school. Yeah, yeah. So there's yeah. a lot written about Amir. it. Yeah, I, I, I almost included the slide because th there was a picture of actually of his the parade that accompanied his burial. Yes. In, oh, in, wow. uh, in uh, I think it was right here in, uh, uh, it was not only Chittenden County, but I think it yeah, might have been Burlington. Yeah. Is he not buried in, on Lake yeah. which Greenwood? Uh, no. I think Lake, so. That's where Lake he is. View. Yeah. Lakeview Cemetery, I'm yeah. pretty sure. Yeah, I think you're correct. I, I'm, a, I'm a volunteer friend of Lakeview Cemetery. And we do a tour, used to do it annually, but COVID kind of interrupted that. And we stop at all of our Otis Howard's burial site and spend a lot of time telling what he did and how much he contributed. And it was just chance that he ended up in Burlington because his son was the architect of Fort Ethan Allen. I was wondering how he ended up here because he wasn't born here. No. And, you know, and, and he certainly didn't do any real duty here. Sometimes military officers will retire close to where they where they serve their last posting. But uh, no, it was his son. All right. Now that certainly explains it. Um, yeah, no, I, you, I could give I, somebody should be invited to give you a talk just on Howard because he, it was a remarkable life. And what about Charles Gould, the famous general? Well, <laughs> tell us about him. I really don't know very much about him. He's related to Marge Sharp. Marge was Gould. And he's probably related to me. And he's, he's depicted, he went down with his troops, black troops, and he's depicted uh, on the uh, Ba Relief in Boston. Oh. Yeah, you know, I'll, I'll just uh, reiterate that somebody, I'm not going to do it because I have other projects that are 
uh, I'm, I'm uh, focused on right now, but boy, somebody ought to take a look at uh, the um, large number of Vermonters who accepted commissions in those um, USCT regiments. Um, that, you know, 42 out of 400 is just, you know, there, it, we, it, somebody should look into what were, what, what was going on there. And, you know, did it, was the service in Louisiana, did that have an, it must have had an impact when they were up front, sort of up, up close to the impact of enslavement. And they saw what had been done and the impact and the people who came to their lines. Um, there are stories of um, fugitives who made it to the camp of the 8th Vermont and uh, the, one of the um, lower ranking officers wanted to return them to their owner and um, the soldiers would have none of it. Um, you know, I, there was plenty of prejudice, but there was also, I think, a, um, a great unhappiness with the institution of slavery. Um, you know, it was not universal, but um, it took something to uh, step forward and accept a commission in one of these regiments because you were putting your life, not only you were risking your life on the battlefield, but you're risking your life should you ever be uh, taken prisoner. Somebody should do, tell that story or at least dig into that a little bit more. Any more questions, Sarah? Just a comment. Um, one of the best events we ever had at the Vermont Historical Society in my time involved there was when the Twitchell family had a family reunion at VHS and trotted out all the memorabilia, much of which is now held at VHS. Uh, and you know, we heard the story in depth. Um, it, it was fascinating. Yeah. You know, for I think you know the Twitchell story is well known. It's the story of these other people yeah. that I think we ought to pay some attention to because it clearly Twitchell was not a one-off. No. no. And there were other people who somehow found it within themselves to, and and, and in some cases really were educators, soldiers and educators, an interesting mix who uh, were very keen on um, helping to set up schools um, uh, as well as, you know, enforce uh, all the other, trying to do all the other things that the Freeman's Bureau attempted to do at least. Uh, so that's a, that, it's just such a rich story. And, uh, you know, when these teachers want to do more with reconstruction in Vermont schools, I hope if you ever have the opportunity to, lend a voice of support. Um, it's to tell these stories that have really been forgotten and they shouldn't be. So thank you very, very much. I'll, I'll let you get back to your meeting. Unless there's somebody else, one more question. If there are a number of uh, Massachusetts 54th uh, men buried in Lakeview Cemetery right here in Burlington. And we stopped there on a school tour just this spring when a teacher, just to your point of teaching more broadly about all that era, offered uh, a, 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 an end of the season uh, experiential kind of thing called creamies and cemeteries. <laughs> <laughs> so I have to go on one of those. <laughs> I thought it was, I thought it might have meant cremation. And <laughs> but no. Maybe it meant both. <laughs> and we stopped at a couple of those uh, barriers. They're together, four or five of them. Um, but um, it, uh, I thought that was a great way to bring students in yes. and also to not only speak about the generals and the World War I and World War II people, but also some people that we don't recognize as Vermonters from that era who are right here in our midst. Yeah, just so just so people, if they are, if anyone is scratching your head, why why are we talking about uh, Massachusetts soldiers here in Vermont? Is that um, there wasn't qu quite enough uh, free black Vermonters 
to constitute a, a full regiment. So the nearest, essentially, they, they, they enlisted in the nearest regiment, which was the 54th Massachusetts. Um, uh, but they were from towns and, and cities in Vermont. Um, and they're, you know, all over about 150 or so you know, not enlisted in one, one unit or another. And that's a great story to, 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 to find their, their, where they're buried. And River Street Cemetery, I, I showed a slide of, is another place where there are 12 buried, side by, not side by side, but within a, you know, a small area. All marked with the um, star of the um, uh, Grand Army of the Republic, the GAR. They, they were members of the Veterans Organization. It was integrated. Hmm. So thank you again. Uh, it was, uh, I wish you well. Uh, it's been a pleasure. And I'll turn this over to Carolyn. So thank you very much. And we're all praying that your house is okay. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Take care.